So let's talk about objectives for today. <clears throat> we talked a little bit about the overall agenda, um, but in terms of what I would love for you all to walk away with, number one is, you know, Google Analytics 4 has hundreds of metrics that we can choose from, and it can often feel really overwhelming to drink through that fire hose. Um, on top of that, Google Analytics 4, I think, is a little bit um, harder to find the things that are important to us. And so I'm really hoping that we can provide a framework for you all to consider to use in your work as you think about how we might be able to sift through the different metrics that are important to the work that you're doing. Number two is um, as we start to kind of settle in on the metrics that feel important to us, how do we use those to build storytelling into our reporting, right? Um, as we start to collect those metrics and look at them on a regular basis, what can we do when we're either looking at them for ourselves or reporting those out to other people? Because ultimately reporting numbers by themselves really just doesn't provide context or any sort of recommended action to move forward, right? If I told you that we had 10,000 people come to our website, it's not clear whether that's good or bad or improving or declining, right? And so it's also not giving you a context of what should your team do about it and why, right? And so we're going to talk a little bit about what's the best approach for or what's a framework for building some storytelling into our reporting. I mentioned also that we are going to carve out some time to actually do work. Like I said, I know um, oftentimes we don't have time and space to actually try new things. And so hopefully what we can do here is give you all some space to try a new thing, build some momentum, and hopefully walk away from this today with a starting point that you can share with others or continue to work on um, within your organization. And then lastly, stick around to the end. We've got a number of free tools along the way that I'm going to share with you. And of course, um, an offer that hopefully will be valuable to you to help continue this work at, as you move forward. So let's hop right in here. I'm going to start to, to talk about this framework that we're going to be walking through over the next hour or so. Um, and we really like to break it down into five different questions. And this is a framework that we use with all of our clients when we're starting to do what we call measurement planning, right? And it's really a fancy word for figuring out which metrics are most important and then how to report those to different people within the organization. So we break this framework into sort of two different groups. The first is the selection portion. Um, and so we're gonna walk through those first three questions right now. And then we're going to take a break, give you some time to do a little bit of work on your own, do a group share out. And then number two, we'll start to talk about now that we know what metrics we want to select, uh, how do we then report those? How do we make it meaningful using storytelling? Along the way here, we are going to be kind of walking you through a case study um, that hopefully gives you an example. And I'll also give you an example worksheet of a measurement plan that we built with this case study with this organization. Um, it's notable that this case study has been anonymized. There, as far as I checked last, there is no immigrant legal alliance, but all of the information related to this case study is real. Um, and so just to describe who this anonymized organization is, Immigrant Legal Alliance educates immigrants, community organizations, and the legal sector to help build a U.S. legal immigration system that respects and values everybody's rights. So if you want to follow along, hopefully this will be a helpful tool for everybody as we go through this process. Here's a link. If you just want to um, load this into your browser or download it so that you have it as an example, this is the worksheet that we're going to do today together. And I'm gonna kind of walk you through this step-by-step step as we go through this framework. So as I said before, we're gonna jump in and just do this first section of metric selection. And we're gonna walk through and just go question by question and talk about how that uh, works for this particular organization. So starting point of all of this is starting to think really broadly about our organization. And the question is, what are the outcomes your organization seeks to achieve with your work, right? So right out the gate, it's really important to mention here that we are looking at outcomes and not metrics. If you're familiar with things like logic models or theories of change, we're really starting at that 30,000 foot level to think about who are we as an organization and how does the work that we do impact the communities and individuals that we are in service to. We're not talking about 
website specifically or metrics specifically, we're really looking at broad strategic objectives of the organization. So when we look at ILA and the outcomes that they seek as an organization, they want to increase immigrant community awareness about their rights. They want to build capacity within the legal community to defend the rights of immigrants. And they want to support systemic legal reform through on the ground organizing and advocacy. And so for those of you that are following along at home, um, we have filled out step one of that example worksheet with those three strategic objectives of the organization. And again, if you click on the link in the chat, that'll take you there. So that was simple enough, right? We, if you want to start with your logic model or a theory of change, if you have that, or even a strategic plan, those can be a good place to source out some of the answers for question number one. Question number two starts to look more specifically at our website. How does our website actually support some of those outcomes that we strategically are seeking, right? So are there programs that are outlined within your website? <clears throat> Is there specific content or are there transactions that take place on the site that help support the work? So for the example that we're going to walk through today, for the purposes of this exercise and the limited amount of time, we're just going to look at one outcome and kind of drill down on that. But in any other time period, we would probably go through one objective at a time or one strategy at a time and kind of outline how the website potentially supports that strategic outcome. I do want to be um, really clear here that there is a possibility that some of these strategic outcomes aren't supported by the website, and that's okay. But in terms of um, starting to think about metrics, obviously, we want to try and support, uh, we want to find the outcomes that are supported by the website. So for the purposes of this exercise, we're going to start to drill down on building the capacity of the legal community to defend the rights of immigrants within the U.S. So the way that ILA's website supports this really is in two different capacities. The first is that they have a whole section on their website where they post legal resources. And then the second area is that they have an events calendar where people can see the different webinars and seminars that they're holding, the different trainings. Um, so that people can go there and take a look. And all of these things are helping to build the capacity of the legal community. Now we're gonna start to look at, okay, we know these two things, these two sections of the site are available to support these strategic outcomes. What does it look like for success to actually happen on the website? What are the things that people are doing to help move that strategic outcome forward? So in the case of ILA, um, on the posts that have legal resources on them, there are also downloadable resources there. And so we want to start to look at when people are really engaging with this content, they are also downloading those resources and taking them with them. The second thing that's happening on their events calendar is when people really see webinars and seminars and trainings that are relevant to their work, they're going to go ahead and RSVP on the website. So these are actual actions that are taking place on the website, and there are associated metrics with those. So you can see again in our example in step two, we've sort of filled this out where we have a column for outcome and we put in our strategic outcome. We start to talk about what is the way in which the website is supporting that outcome, and then what are the associated actions that indicate that those, um, those strategic things are taking place or we're making progress on them. Now, the third thing here is to start to think about what is the website visitor's journey that leads to these actions. Um, now that we know what the end conversion goal is, so for instance, if somebody RSVPs, we can start to look and kind of work our way backwards to think about what are the different steps that somebody takes in order to RSVP on the site, right? And so again, just for the purposes of demonstration, we're gonna drill down onto number two and start to think about what is the user journey on the website for people to RSVP to events. And before we start to talk about specific uh, metrics, I, some of you may or may not be familiar with what some people call an engagement journey or maybe a conversion funnel is another common term for that. But basically the idea here is that anybody that is purchasing something or is taking action on your website goes through 
a similar process every time. Now, if you go out in the internet and start to look at engagement journeys or conversion funnels, you may see a number of different ways that people think about it. Um, but I really like this really simple three-step process of awareness, engagement, and conversion. And so when we're thinking about awareness, we're starting to think about how do people even become familiar with the fact that your organization or your services exist, right? This could happen all kinds of different ways. And this is all of our different marketing activities, right? It could be through a Google search. It could be through something they came upon on social media or events that they attended or advertising you're doing. Um, it could be a referral from a friend, things like that. So this is when people are becoming aware of the fact that you as an organization and your services exist. The second step in this process is called engagement, right? People are reading or watching or engaging in some capacity with the content on your website. But most importantly, they understand now the value that your programs provide, the value that your organization provides in terms of helping them overcome challenges or pain points that they might be experiencing. And then lastly, the conversion is that final step where people are doing the thing that we want them to, doing the thing that's going to move our, our mission forward. So in this case, right, it's RSVPing. So start it, now that we have a kind of a sense of these three steps that most people go through in their journey with us, we can start to think about how do we look at metrics at each stage of this journey. And really this slide right here is kind of the crux of this entire part of the framework. We wanna to start to talk about um, what this looks like in our specific case study. And really when you, I think about a website, I like to think about a collection of user journeys. And we wanna to start to talk about what is the story of that journey and how do metrics tell that story? So by tracking each stage of that journey, we can make adjustments to our work. So if you see that our awareness metrics are kind of dropping off, we can start to think about what are some ways that we can start to drive more people to our website? Could we do more advertising? Could we do more tabling events? Do we need to create community partnerships? Um, if we're recording engagement metrics and they're starting to drop off, maybe we should start to think about you know, um, should we redesign our events calendar so that people can find the things that they want more easily? Or maybe the topics of our events and trainings aren't really resonating with people. They're not sticking around very long, right? Things like that. And then lastly, if people aren't actually, they're going to the page and reading about the event, but we're not seeing them actually RSVP, um, maybe the page is confusing, or maybe the RSVP process asks them to, for too much information. We need to simplify the form. Um, or again, maybe the topics aren't really resonating with them. The way that we're describing the event isn't really giving them what they want. So we'll talk a little bit more about this, but really we're starting to hone in on this idea that we want to have a metric or maybe two that describes each stage of that engagement funnel or that engagement process so that we know and we can tell a story to folks about where we should be sort of focusing our efforts as an organization and as a team. Um, so I'm gonna share with you in a second, we're about to get into the activity, um, a little cheat sheet at the bottom of our worksheet. This is by no means meant to be comprehensive in terms of all of the metrics that are available to us in Google Analytics 4, but it gives you a little bit of a sense of what are some of the common things we might, common metrics we might associate with the different stages, right? So we have some, um, you know, users, sessions, sources. We talked a lot about this, right, in terms of where the traffic is coming from. And that's really a common question that folks have. Um, and then views on engagement. I think that was one of the questions. We talked about engagement rate and average session duration. Um, so there is kind of a new metric within Google Analytics 4 that I really like called engagement rate or engaged sessions. And basically the idea is that a user spends a certain amount of time on a page or clicks through to a second page or performs some sort of conversion event on that page. And that ends up being our engagement rate. That didn't exist in, user, in uh, Universal Analytics. And so for those of you that are interested or ask the question about um, how do we measure engagement on our site? This is one that I really like that's new. And then lastly, in terms of um, different conversion metrics, we have 
um, a lot of different things that you can um, turn into what are called key events in Google Analytics 4, and those are our different metrics. Um, a lot of these conversion events are automatically installed in Google Analytics 4, but there are some also that require you to do this as a, some sort of custom technical setup, which makes Google Analytics 4 a lot more flexible, but also it can make it a little bit harder to use if you're not a super um, technical person. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an overview. I do have a cheat sheet with explanations of all these things, and I will definitely share that out with folks. So we're going to jump back in and start to talk about now that we, in theory, know what we are tracking, how do we create effective reporting or use data storytelling to inform our work? So before that we do anything specific to answering our two questions, I just want to give a little bit of background around why I think data storytelling matters. We hit on this a little bit at the outset, but numbers by themselves are, don't have a whole lot of meaning, right? Uh, again, I said this at the beginning, but if I were to tell you 10,000 people came, we don't really know if that's good or bad. Is it getting better or what, right? So we don't have a lot of meaning by numbers by themselves. Data storytelling helps us bring in context, whether this is good or bad. Are we getting better? Are we declining? Is it sort of the same? Um, so bringing in context, I think, is really important. Also, uh, Data is important because if we know sort of what happened in the past, we may be able to predict or forecast or resource the types of things that we're doing in the future. Um, and so it can be a really helpful planning tool. It can also be a really helpful learning tool. And ultimately, the other thing I like to talk about is that when you get people engaged in um, reporting on a regular basis, this can be an opportunity to celebrate, to inspire, to energize teams, to energize your community, right? If we're doing an impact report or a, um, an annual report or something like that, it doesn't have to just be internal. Uh, and so one of the examples I always like to think about is if you have um, a program manager who frequently writes content for your website, uh, if you were to come to them on a regular basis and give them a sense of how that content is performing, you know, and you said, hey, you know, that last blog post that you wrote was the most popular blog post that we've had this year, that might inspire them and energize them to do it more often, right? Um, so this, even if people aren't initially excited about numbers or things like that, what we really encourage you to do is to consistently close that loop for them, give them a little bit of feedback of what's going on so that hopefully at some point they get more engaged. I've seen it a number of times with clients where they start being more regular about reporting out what's going on on the website to different departments. And people really start to get engaged and invested in the communications work, right? Sometimes our programs team um, isn't quite as invested in that work. And I think that helps. So some tips for data storytelling. Number one, not all numbers are going to be important to everybody. And so we really want to understand who it is that we're talking to when we are reporting numbers. Um, I just mentioned this, but I really think regular reporting, even if people haven't asked for the information, really gets people familiar with what's going on. And eventually, oftentimes, we see people get interested and start to get invested in that communications work and understand the importance of communications work in what you're doing. Less is more. Um, just like I think some of you mentioned in some of the questions that you had, is that there are a fire hose worth of metrics in Google Analytics 4. Um, what I find is that if you can have some really specific questions that people are asking you and just deliver information around those, it's, gonna, um, it's going to make it more meaningful to people and give them a sense of what's going on. And then last thing here that I just wanna point out is the right tools really make this process so important. I think somebody at the outset said, how can I do all of this without taking a whole lot of time? And so we have um, a dashboard that we like to use, and there are a lot of different free ones out there. Um, I'm gonna share a template that you can take from us and use your own data in um, a little bit later here. But dashboards are a really great thing because they democratize the data. People can always access what they want um, and it doesn't take a lot of time, right? You don't have to keep going back in to Google Analytics, pulling reports, getting spreadsheets, delivering it to people, you can actually automate the whole process. And I'll show you that in a second. So jumping back into our framework here, um, we're done with our first section and we're just gonna go through these final two 
questions to start to think about how can we create a template for our reporting or our data storytelling. So who are we reporting to and what do they care about? And this might sound a little bit simple, but what I like to do is create a template um, or a profile, sorry. Who am I reporting to? What role do they play? What are their goals? What actions um, on your website move their goals forward? Are there specific journeys that visitors on the site take or complete? And then are there additional questions, right? And so one of the other cool things about dashboards are you can create a dashboard for every person or every department. Um, it's a really simple thing to do based on what you know is important to them on your website. So within your worksheet, you should just see that there's a pretty simple section where you can fill out, you know, who are you talking to? What are their goals? Um, what are their organizational or department goals? What are the types of things that are meaningful to them? And then what are some additional questions that they might have? And, um, you know, one of the things that I like to do is actually go to that person and ask them, uh, you know, are there specific things that you're interested in? Is it based on location? Is it based on where they're coming from? Um, you know, so these are things where we can actually go to people and ask these questions when we're building out the reports for them. So moving to our final uh, question here is how do I build narrative that makes metrics meaningful and actionable? So um, a couple of elements that I think are important to incorporate into any data storytelling. First of all, time span, right? When you're telling people what happened, what is the amount of time that you're talking about? Um, what, you know, pre presenting kind of that entire visitor journey to them, right? Um, what do those all look like? And you'll remember when I talked about um, the visitor journey and, the, and those metrics is that that gives us an opportunity to really focus in on each stage of our work. And so again, if we see, hey, um, your page views on one of your key pages dropped 20%, why, why do we think that happened? And we can kind of drill down on that and, and talk about opportunities to improve there. Context and comparison, right? I mentioned this before, but giving people a sense of, are we getting better? Is this an increase, a decrease? Are things uh, better than they were last year, so to speak? Making it relevant, right? Answering those key questions again. Um, and then lastly here, Making it actionable, and this doesn't always mean that whatever you're saying is 100% correct. I think it's totally okay to make a hypothesis or even bring it up as a point of conversation with somebody like, hey, we saw a huge jump in traffic on this particular page. Was there a specific campaign that you ran? Did you go to an event? You know, you can ask people. It's okay if you don't know, but it, I think it's worth bringing it up to them so that you can flag it and have a great conversation with them. Um, so I just wanted to walk you through what a really quick report might look like and in hopes that it gives you a bit of a template that you can use um, when you're going through and doing reporting on your own. So last month, we saw event calendar traffic increase to 1,253 visitors. It's an increase of 43% year over year. During the same time period, we saw 450 RSVPs an increase of 54% year over year. Users are curious about the DACA webinar and we had 567 engaged sessions on that page. Now we're talking about answering key questions and maybe giving a little context or hypothesis. These increases were largely driven by LinkedIn traffic and we believe that the increase in video posts on LinkedIn has led to these results and our social media team should double down on this strategy. Right, so you're making a little bit of an assumption or a hypothesis there, and that just opens up engagement and conversation with folks that hopefully helps give them a little bit of a, a recommendation on how they might want to move forward. So I've been talking about it a bunch, but I wanted to give you a really quick run through of a simple dashboard that we have. Um, this runs on Google's free dashboard builder, which was renamed to Looker Studio, which I don't like that name. So I like calling it Google Data Studio still. Um, but Google Data Studio is a free platform and you can integrate all kinds of different types of data in here. This particular template just uses Google Analytics. And the thing that's kind of neat here is you can see we've got our funnel for our event RSVP we are answering specific questions. What are the most popular events? Um, just so you know, this has some um, 
some stock data from Google in here. So that's why these pages look weird. It actually comes from the Google uh, store where you can buy Google merchandise. So, um, but you can replace your data with this, um, this data. Other questions on here, what channels drove the most traffic right here? Again, we see our direct, uh, apparently Google's not using UTM tags either. And then down at the bottom, we have just our written out report. So the thing that's really neat about these dashboards is number one, you can also have filters on here. So if people are just interested in looking at specific things, you can do that. And then people have the capability to pull reports on their own of different um, date ranges. If they wanna change it, they're really curious about sort of two months instead of one month, they can do this on their own. The other thing that ne that's neat about this is you can schedule this delivery so that you could send it to somebody on your team or your department um, once a month or things of that nature. You can always download it as a PDF as well. And you can also just share it with folks through an invite. So all you would need to do, I'll, I'm gonna share this link with you, but you would come in here and just make a copy that would drop a copy into your Google account and you could start from there. And of course, um, you know, if you ever run into problems, we're happy to be a resource on this and help you um, try and get this set up. Uh, again, this is just one interpretation. Google Data Studio, you can make it do whatever you want. We can also incorporate um, statistics or data that comes off of spreadsheets. You can link into Facebook accounts and all sorts of different stuff here. Um, so I'll have a question about the, yeah. the marketing channel. So, um, kind of what we were saying in the chat, I've noticed with um, analytics, it, it, it's it's not as precise with telling mm -hmm. you where people came from. And so I'm wondering, because in your example, um, it was saying that um, LinkedIn had driven more people to the website. Do you have good like workarounds for determining um your, the people who come to the website, like which platforms they're coming from. I know we can yes. see like on social media, the actual um, like engagement, but um, yeah, I'm curious if there's anything else that Google offers or something that you work with that you can see more precisely yeah. where people are coming from and if it actually translate them to, to those people taking action on um, the site. Yeah, great question. So what this is reporting is there's sort of three layers of information within these UTM tags. The one that you're looking at here is sort of this overarching grouping of stuff, right? So for instance, um, organic social would incorporate, I think there's like maybe 10 or 15 different sites that are incorporated naturally into Google's interpretation of organic social. But within that group, there's actually a smaller set of data, I think called medium, where you can actually look at the specific site. So um, in some dashboards we have, if you click on this, you can actually drill down into the category and see face, it, you know, 10% came from Facebook, 20% came from LinkedIn. So you can get that information um, in here actually um, on some dashboards. And that information is available in Google Analytics as well. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, and again, you know, basically the way that you structure your UTM code ends up um, bringing some of that data in. Uh, sometimes it, it happens um, naturally as well. Um, so again, we will share this with you. Um, and I actually, in the next slide here, I have a link in case you're interested in taking a look at it um, and getting started with it. But we will follow up with a link to this. So some of the reasons that we love dashboards, as I mentioned before, dashboards mean that there are no gatekeepers. It means less time for you all. If people are like, hey, will you pull us a, a report of the last month in Google Analytics and blah, blah, blah here's your dashboard. You can go ahead and change the dates and take a look. <laughs> um, so also, as I said before, democratizing data, I think it gets people more interested in it. Um, I also find the Google Analytics 4 interface really confusing in terms of it gives you a lot of information, but not a lot of visuals. And so I think that the dashboard approach gives you a much more meaningful thing where you can really focus in on the things that are important to you. Um, there are a lot of different platforms out there. There are some free, there are some paid. Um, Google Data Studio or Google Looker is free if you use Google products. 
Power BI, I think is the common one that is used with Microsoft products. And I believe it's a paid solution, but if you are using Microsoft products, you might have access to that in your Microsoft suite. But just to wrap things up, cause I know people are gonna have to leave soon. For anybody that's interesting, if you have technical questions or you wanna review the worksheet that you did, or you just wanna talk about um, content strategy generally, this is a link to my calendar. Please feel free to find a time that works for you. Happy to spend some time talking about all things analytics, all things digital marketing, all things nonprofit marketing. Um, also, oh, hold on, let me put this in the chat. Um, also, we have these on a pretty regular basis. If you're interested in segmentation of messaging that connects with your community, that's our next event coming up in July. So feel free to RSVP there. And then lastly, um, we put these events on all the time and it's really, really, really helpful for us to get feedback about things that worked well, things that um, maybe there are opportunities to improve because everybody's going to benefit if we can continue to make these better. So really appreciate any feedback that you can provide to us in this quick survey. It only takes a couple of minutes and um, really appreciate everybody's time um, and interaction. And thanks for sticking with me. I, I wish Val was here, but um, hopefully you found this uh, useful. And um, thanks again for sticking with me. Anybody looking for inspiration, if there's one thing you wanna put out in this world and manifest, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, what is the one thing that, uh, or insight today from today's session that you maybe wanna share or maybe want to pursue a little bit further? Go ahead and put it in the chat. Like I said, I'll stick around if anybody has questions um, or things that they wanted to review, I'll stick around afterwards um, so you can hang out and ask questions.